Uh, anybody got issues in their life? Pastor, that was the stupidest question I've ever heard you ask in my life. <laughs> but it's so true, isn't it? We, we've got all these issues in our life. And as we, I think what's so comforting about God's word is as we look through God's word, we see that everyone has issues, right? We live in this, this fallen world around fallen people. And all of us as individuals are the chief of those fallen people. As Paul said, right? I am the chief of sinners. And, um, and so that comes uh, with a lot of issues. Man, you got, you got family issues. You got marital issues. You got financial issues. You got kid issues. You got work issues. It's just like, it's nonstop. If it ain't one thing, it's a hundred. And, uh, and that's just so true. And then... You die. Issue over. <laughs> Dan just said church dismissed. That's probably not a bad idea. Just... <laughs> I'm going to, uh, uh, well, we looked last time with Abraham and his issues, obviously, he had some uh, some family issues and 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 what have you, and and we see Ishmael uh, and and Hagar going their own way, and that uh, um, he uh, he encounters this Abimelech fellow. Now, uh, some would think that this is the same Abimelech that we see back in chapter twenty, but some think it's different because Abimelech, Abimelech was. More like a title, like a Herod or a, or a Caesar or something. And, uh, and so Abraham has this encounter with his neighbor. Anybody got neighbor issues? Right? Ah, you got to be careful with that one, right? Uh, people under their breath, you know, will whisper, I hate my neighbor. You can't do that. God might kill you for that. You got to love your neighbor. You know, as yourself, as the scripture says, but we're um, we're gonna we're gonna read through this uh, this passage. It goes from uh, verse 22 to verse 34, and let's pray over it first. Father, thank you for your word that um, is truly that light and a, and a guide. It's a sure guide in an unsure world, Lord. And and uh, though we uh, we see trouble in the people's lives, Lord, who lived long ago. Uh, no different than ours, as your servant Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. And so, Father, we just pray now that as we look at your word, Lord, that we would glean things, that we would realize you've called us, Lord. You've called us to yourself first, and you've called us to be a witness in this world. And we, you've called us to bring before our God the issues that we have in our life, Lord. And, um, and you... Uh, you are the one who can make sense of it all, Lord. You can bring those tough situations uh, that we find ourselves in, and you can bring good out of them. And so, Lord, we just pray that uh, you would do that and show us those truths, Lord, that we would be truly be set free by your truth. Lord, we lift up uh, Bailey on the Dwight D. Eisenhower. Lord, I pray that you'd be with him and, and draw us his heart to you as, as many of our soldiers are going into uh, maybe into harm's way, Lord. And we just pray that you would be with them and watch over them. And uh, Lord, that they would lift their head and look to you. That we pray the same for the nation of Israel and the nation uh, of the of the Arabs. Lord, we pray that they would all turn to you and realize you're the you're the one that butters their bread and uh, and gives them life. So just pray for a, a turning uh, to the God of heaven, Lord. For truly, it feels as though time is short. So help us as your people to be ready for that and to continue to press into your word as we are this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Starting in verse 22, it says, And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, or Phicol, the, the commander of the army, spoke to Abraham, saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me, with my offspring or my posterity, but that according to the kindness that I have done to you, you will do to me. Uh, that you will 
do to me and to the land in which you have dwelt. And Abraham said, I will swear. And then Abraham rebuked Abimelech because of a well of water, which Abimelech's servants had seized. And Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, nor did I, nor had I heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep, oxen, gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech asked Ab Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs which you have set by themselves? And he said, you will take these seven ewe lambs from my hand that they may be my witness that I have dug this well Therefore, he called the place Beersheba, because the two of them swore an oath there. Thus, they made a covenant at Beersheba. So Abimelech rose with Phicol, the commander of his army, and they returned to the land of the Philistines. And then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines many days. And so he goes from one confrontation to another. And isn't that just kind of how it is? There was a, there was a psychologist by the name of Scott uh, that, you know, obviously psychologists and psychiatrists have a pretty bum job, right? They hear everybody's problems and they are actually supposed to have the answer for these people. And as a pastor, I get a lot of people coming to me with their problems. <laughs> I ain't got the, I got one answer, Jesus. <laughs> so, you know, case solved, you can go. And, um, and I think uh, it's a pretty high suicide rate among the, that profession is psychiatry and, and, and what have you. But this, this psych, uh, psychiatrist was uh, fairly wise. He said, until people understand and embrace the truth that life is difficult, life will continue to be difficult. But when you embrace the idea that life is difficult and it's going to be difficult until this life is over, then life's not quite as difficult. Is that elementary? That's elementary. Why? Why is this happening? Because life's difficult, okay? Please get used to it and just know that it is. I mean, this last week, the, the people that I've had to minister, it's all about death. It's all about death this last week. I mean, from, from young people to old people and, and the death of loved ones. Has anybody had any of their loved ones die? You have, right? And that's a weighty thing. It's heavy, and we're to bear one another's burdens, but not without hope, uh, not in total despair, right? We are um, all subject to this. And um, yes, there's tears. Yes, it's heavy. Yes, you got to plan funerals. Uh, yes, you got to say goodbye. But, uh, and Jesus truly is the answer, when, especially when it comes to that. And, and uh, you know, for me trying to have funerals and, well, I can't do this funeral on this day because I got to do this funeral on that day, right? It's a, it's a, it's a funeral conflict. <laughs> oh, but they got to throw a wedding in there, right? Which some said they're kind of one and the same. No, I'm just kidding. But I'm okay. It is the death of a bachelor and a bachelorette. Right? Okay. But Proverbs, the book of Proverbs tell us, keep your heart with all the diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence. Do you realize your greatest responsibility as a believer in Jesus is to keep your heart in a right place? And yet, 
how quickly we allow ourselves to be embittered or offended and, and get sideways with one another or even with God. The people that I talk to, they're so mad with, they're mad at God. And um, they haven't learned that life is difficult, right? Yeah, get a flak jacket, get a helmet. But, but Abraham, it says here in verse 22, and it came to pass that at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of the army, spoke to Abraham saying, God is with you in all that you do. When people look at your life, do they say that? Because I, I, I've seen people like that. I'm going, what, what is it, this person? It's just like the Lord blesses everything. They, they're just blessed. Are you blessed this morning? Because in Jesus, there's, there's no comparison. You're blessed. God is with you. If you've received Christ and, and, and abandon, abandon your life of sin, you got to do that too. People want to receive Christ, but so many people don't want to abandon their life of sin, right? Oh, I, I kind of like this one. Doesn't work that way. It's all or nothing. And um, they recognized that God was with Abraham. Abr now, it's interesting because this guy's name's Abimelech. So he maybe was the, came after the other Abimelech that Abraham had lied to. So maybe he's got uh, 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 paying attention to this Abraham character, but, but it seems that his witness is strong enough that God is with him in all that he does. I love the, the quote by Charles Haddon Spurgeon um, from this quote, God is with you in all that you do. Um, he said this, he said, I think the greatest blessing God ever gives to a man is his own presence. That's the greatest gift that God gives to you is his presence, right? And he says, he goes on and he says, if I had my choice of all the blessings of this life, I certainly should not ask for wealth. He says, for that can bring no ease. You know how many people are chasing wealth? Thinking. It's like, the, it's like the one rich man that Jesus talked about, right? The dude that had the bumper crop. Ha! I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger and better barns and take a life of ease. There is no life of ease this side of heaven. Just saying. I don't care what your bank account or your 401k looks like. Which, which could be in jeopardy, by the way. Uh, uh, there is no life of ease this side of heaven. It's not. Jesus promised it wasn't. So why would we pursue that and try to seek out a life of ease? Now, I'm right with you. I like it when things are easy. But I know that a lot of times prosperity is a curse it is a curse because it diverts our attention away from who god is and how much we need him in our life and so if you're prosperous please uh please be generous right uh you don't have to be generous to me or the the fellowship here but be generous to someone right because that's how you keep from doing this right and um Spurgeon had it down, man. This guy had it figured out. He says, because with it, with wealth, there is no ease. And I certainly should not ask for popularity, for there is no rest to the man upon whose words men constantly wait. Why would we want people to know who we are? I don't want people to know who I am. And that can be a curse as well. Right? Because they watch you like a hawk. And I'm telling you, there is a lot of unimpressed people that know who I am. You are a pastor. And I am a sinner. And I still don't drive very good. 
So I, I, many of you know I was at the school for some 20, 25 years, 20 years, I guess it was, and uh, felt like 30 sometimes, but I, I was driving the bus. I dropped the kids off and I was headed back and man, I was, I was tuned in to something other than driving. It got me in trouble last night with my wife. Coming back from Gooding, about killed us. You guys were just this close to planning a funeral. And, um, and I'm driving the bus down John Adams. Do you know that the speed limit on John Adams is 25 miles an hour? I don't go 25 miles an hour anywhere. So I'm driving the school bus, and I'm driving that baby, and I mean, I'm headed up to a stop sign, and I look in my mirror, and there's Whirly Bird lights back there. And I pull over, and this, this police officer, an Idaho Falls police officer, he walks up there. You know, I, I open the door like you do to let the kids in. He stands there like I ducked. No. He stands there with his hands on his hips like this, and he goes, I've been following you for six blocks. Yes, sir. Would you do your church proud and do your school proud and go the speed limit? Yes, officer, I will. He didn't give me a ticket. But one of my students who had been driving for about three months saw it. And she told a couple of her friends, Pastor Scott, he got pulled over by an Idaho Falls police officer. He's a great example, ain't he? Please don't follow my example. Follow Jesus' example. And you can't go wrong. So, but, but uh, Spurgeon goes on to say, he says, and it is a hard task one has to perform in such a case as that being popular. But I should choose as my highest honor to have God always with me. Amen. I, and, and I didn't realize that till I was about eight or 10 years into my Christian life, realizing that, oh, I thought, I thought that my greatest purpose was to be a witness and to go out and do ministry. No, my greatest purpose is to be tight with God, right? Because then everything else flows out of that. But in your, in your family and your work and, and, and your witness is to have God with you. And I don't know, with a crowd this size, there's probably some in here that have not come to that place of surrendering. And I'm promising you, it takes a surrender, a full surrender to the Lord to have him with you so that he can walk with you and he can convict you, knowing, you knowing that when God convicts you, you're going to turn. Because so many people, they get convicted, but they don't turn. And there is no one more miserable than somebody who is convicted by the Holy Spirit, but won't turn. That's grieving the Spirit of God. And so uh, God wouldn't have you do that. He would just have you be in his will with him walking beside you throughout your life, directing your steps. And it is an incredible witness. Obviously, these two men are impressed with what God is doing in Abraham's life. You remember King Solomon, right? Back in 1 Kings, and I'm bringing this up because this has been in our reading, King Solomon. You remember, he's, he's young. Um, it appears that he may have already been married, but God shows up to him at night in a dream. He says, ask me, what do you want? You guys know the story, right? Ask me, what do you want? You know, it wasn't like a genie in the Bible, three wishes. It was, ask me, what do you want? You're the king of my people. You're the king of my nation, Israel. What do you want? And Solomon says, and your servant, O Lord, is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too, numbers to be, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart 
to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? Solomon realized that he needed help. And you remember, God gave him wisdom. He's arguably the wisest man who ever lived, except when it came to women. When it came to women, he's dumber than a post. That's pretty dumb. He, uh, and eventually gets the kingdom. I'm just in the part now where the kingdom is ripped. It's going to be ripped away from the descent. Didn't wasn't ripped away from Solomon. It's ripped away from his son. You know your sin doesn't just affect you, right? Doesn't just affect you. I, I it, it just it chops my hide when people go, I ain't hurt nobody. Oh yeah. You're hurting people that you don't even know. Your posterity, right, or effect is affected by your secret sin that you pet and you hang on to when you should be killing it. And so it affected Rehoboam, but God granted Solomon that. If God showed up to you, say in a dream tonight, what would you ask for? Right? I just say, take me home, Jesus. God, I've had enough. So, you just got to ask, right? Just ask. James 1.5 tells us, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it shall be given to him. It's about drawing close to God. God says, right? Draw close to me and I'll draw close to you. Abe drew, drew close to the Lord. The Lord drew close to him. And it was a witness. It was evident to everybody that knew him. And so it was obvious that Abraham was a man of great wealth, influence, and power. And maybe Abimelech had heard of his lying problem. So he says, please swear to me, swear to me that you will treat, right? My posterity, my, uh, my relatives, to, that you'll treat them well. Will you swear to me? Are you going to lie to them? Maybe not. Maybe he just knew because of the influence that, that Abraham had, the strength actually that he had. That, um, and so. Abraham says, okay, I'll swear. I'll swear. I'll, 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 I'll take that oath. It's like uh, uh, being a man of your word. Whatever you, you say, you'll do. You know, Solomon talked about that. It's better to not bow at all. In other words, it's better to say no than to bow and not pay. Right? It's better to not bow at all than to bow and not pay. So Abraham swears. Um, he says, okay, I swear, I'll do my, my part. I'll treat your family well. However, however, there's a little, he's got a little angst here, right? However, there is one thing that we need to discuss. And you find it there in verse 25. And Abraham rebuked Abimelech because of a well of water, which Abimelech's servants had seized. And Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, nor had I heard of it until now, until today. So obviously it sounds like Abraham believed him. And, and so um, this was Abraham's well. And his servants had seized it, had taken it over. And, uh, and so they, uh, they come together on this certain issue, the well issue. Because in that, you think about that country over there. You've seen pictures of it this last week. It is a desolate, arid country. And yet they dug wells there by hand. And it was, in fact, their life source, this well, uh, that was there. And so Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two made a covenant. This is a 
this word actually literally means treaty. I, I looked up how many treaties Israel has had in the last uh, 75 years since they've been a nation. Holy cow, there is a buckle load. And they usually, usually get broken, right? A treaty is a, is a promise, it's a covenant. And, um, and so they, they come together and they, they reason. And they seem to be not hostile to each other, but hey, let's work this out. Are you that person that, that's willing to work things out? Or do you just set your jaw? Yeah, I, I see married couples all the time. One wants counseling, the other goes. I mean, if, they, if looks could kill, you'd be dead. Uh, you know, if they could do it without anybody seeing it, they'd give you the finger, you know, sort of a thing. Some people want counseling. Some people ain't no way. Some people would rather take their last breath than, than come together and try to work something out with an enemy, with a spouse, sometimes with a child. I know parents and kids that haven't spoken 15, 20 years. I, I don't understand that. I mean, I've been sideways with my family before, but we always come together and end up hashing it out. Life's too short to let things be severed, to let relationships be dissolved. Why would anyone want to do that? And, and so it sound, sounds like these two are, are taking, you know, the one scripture where in Isaiah where it says, come, let us reason together, says the Lord. These two are willing to come. Hey, let's, let's work this out. Let's work this out. This, this thing's going to benefit both of us. And Abraham has a, a good enough witness where this guy feels like he can trust him. Proverbs 16, 7. I love this scripture. It says that when a man's ways please the Lord, he even, even his enemies are at peace with him. When a man's ways please, please the Lord. And I, 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 I know people in our community that are upset with me. And I don't go to their house. But if I see them on the street, I want to be cordial. Say, hey, man, how you doing? Yeah, I know you don't, I know you hate my guts, but I don't hate yours. And if you ever want to talk, I'm available. Now I know, I know that's Jesus. Because that ain't me. Because I can be the worst banny rooster you ever saw strut and be all that and be a stinking jerk and and um but the lord brings a calm and he brings he brings something to you that ain't you thank you lord right and so um these guys are are they're going to work this out they make a covenant they make this agreement and um Verse 28 says, and Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And then Abimelech asked, Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs which you have set by themselves? So now you see that verse there in 27. He said he brought sheep and oxen to him. Maybe they'd cut covenant there. Maybe they cut them like they like we see back right in, in chapter 15. Maybe they cut covenant with those. And then, but he wanted to seal the deal. He wanted to make sure there was no confusion. Number seven, seven new lambs, these innocent little lambs. What's the number seven? The number of completion, right? To make the covenant complete, right? That you'll never ever to sit, you'll never ever say that I am not the one that dug this well. That we're, we're in agreement here. And so that's what, Actually, Beersheba can mean two things. It can mean the oath of the seven or the oath or just the oath. It can be the oath of the seven or just the oath, Beersheba. And there's uh, conjecture on that, but it's, it's the oath. It's still called that today. I think the Jews, the Hebrews pronounce it Sheva or Sheva, Sheva, Sheva. And, um, and that, that well is still there today. In fact, you can go see it. And, and notice, let me finish here. He says, and Abimelech also asked Abraham about that. Sorry, verse 30. And he said, 
you will take these seven ewe lambs for of my hand and that they may be a witness that I have dug this well. Therefore, he called the place Beersheba because the two of them swore an oath there and they made a covenant at Beersheba. So Abimelech rose and Phicol and the commander of his army and they returned to the land of the Philistines and Abraham planted a tamarisk tree there in Beersheba. So when you go and look at this well today in Beersheba, there's a, there's a tamarisk tree there. And they're, a, they're a, a pretty hardy tree. We don't know if it's, if it's the same one he planted or they've just replaced it. But that, the well itself, it's 12 feet wide and 42 feet deep. And, uh, and you can go, go and see it when you're over there in Israel. It's down there in Beersheba. And um, there's an inscription there that was inscribed back in 1112 uh, AD. And so um, just a confirmation, something. And he, but he planted the tree uh, as, a, as a indicating that he was going to stay put. He was going to stay right there, right there in southern Israel. Uh, and I think it said, here it says the, the land of the Philistines at that time, right? There was no, no occupation of the tribes of Israel at that time. And so he was kind of in a foreign land, but he was in the promised land. Uh, kind of like us, right? We're in the kingdom of God, but we are still here, right? So we're sojourning, but our, the Bible says our citizenship is in heaven, right? And so this is a, this is a powerful thing that he does here with, with planting this tree. And when you go there today, there's one of those trees right there uh, close to the well. And then Abraham does something. This is the third time we see it in his life. And it says, and there, there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Abraham called on the name of the Lord. And as I was thinking about this, I said, well, this, there's three records of him calling on the name of the Lord. Can you look back in your life? As I look back in my life, I, I remember all those times I called. I called on the Lord. I mean, even when I wasn't, well, wasn't quote unquote saved, right? I was, I was kind of set apart because I, my, my grandma had prayed me there, right? And the hounds of heaven were after me, right? But when I was nine years old, I remember, I remember calling on the name of the Lord. I had a Baptist preacher in his, in his, in his suit. He got down on his knees with me. I was a nine-year-old boy. He got down on his knees with me in a prayer room and led me in a prayer to ask Jesus into my heart. And I called on the name of the Lord that day. And then later when I was 14 and and my dad had gotten saved, and we didn't know what was going on with him. See, he was kind of a wild man. My dad had gotten saved, and he took me to church. And they had an altar call. He said, son, you want to go up? And I said, I didn't really want to go up, but he kind of gave me a little nudge. And I went up there, and the, the man, I remember, was an elder in this church in Twin Falls, a Christian center in Twin Falls. And he says, son, how can I pray for you? And I remember, I mean, just thinking about it tears me up. I, I remember the Holy Spirit just coming over me like a, and I couldn't even talk. I just started bawling like a baby. And life was just, life was just crazy for us at that time, right? My stepdad got thrown in the joint. We were up here visiting. We had to go back and I didn't want to go back. And then I tried to run away. From, I mean, life was just tumultuous. But I remember the Lord touching my heart. Maybe you remember, you look back and you remember the Lord, that still small voice. He was going, come, what are you doing? Come here, come to me. You're going to have rest. You're going to have peace. You're going to have fulfillment of life. And, and then in 1985, in the fall of the year, right? The last part of October, right after Halloween. Oh, I threw my hands in the air. I was done. I called on the name of the Lord and he met me right there. Those three different times I remember, but then since I've been walking with him, right? Things, the trouble, right? The trouble and the issues of life, what do they do? Hopefully they drive you to the altar, to the throne of God and get on your knees and seek him. And he called on the name of the Lord. Notice he says here specifically, 
the everlasting God. He, he's implying that, listen, he does not change. He's everlasting. He's perpetual. He's always been. It's just that we haven't always been seeking him. That's the problem. And Abraham, with all this stuff going on in his life, whether with his neighbor or his, his uh, slave girl, Hagar, and his son, Ishmael, and Sarah, and Isaac, all this stuff. And he does what every one of us should do. He calls on the name of the Lord. And maybe today, the Lord would have you uh, call on him. God never changes. People think that, right, you Christian, you're just so sticks in the mud, right? You just think that everything is same old, same old, same old laws. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. Well, I've learned something as I've been walking with the Lord. If you focus on this is right, and this is right, and this is right, and this is right, the wrong just kind of takes care of itself, right? It, it exposes itself for what it really is. And um, because the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is one of my favorite scriptures. People sometimes, they, you put Romans 6.23 on a birthday card? Yeah, I want to remind people. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Right? I mean, what, what better contrast? Those are just great reminders, aren't they? Right? People get after me. Romans 6.23. Really? How? Yeah. That's what's pro. That's what the. Well, that sounds so. That's so distasteful. No, it's not. It's just proclaiming truth. I love what Malachi says about the Lord. For I am the Lord. I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Good thing God hasn't changed, right? He's had his hand on Israel this week. In a big way. Why doesn't Israel look like a pile of gravel? Because this dude right here. Sorry, I called God a dude. That's sacrilegious. This person right here. That is everlasting. Then he says, yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, says the Lord, and I will return to you. You been messing around? I was messing around. I mean, I, I, I had just decided in my own heart, no, no public display of, of a conversion. I just decided in my heart that, uh, Lord, I know I need to get right with you, right? I, I was, I, I'd almost died. I should have gotten killed many times, but the one was just glaring. I, Lord, I know I need to get right with you. So I was, I was trying to be a good, good boy. I was trying to be a good boy. And I was trying to quit drinking and be a witness and, and uh, all those things. But I lacked something. I lacked total surrender. I lacked total surrender to the Lord. There were some of my things that I kind of liked and I kept to me. And it wasn't until the Lord just lambasted me with um, his goodness, actually. He exposed, it was like it, was, it, like it happened simultaneously. He exposed his goodness and my wickedness all at the same time. And I'm going, God, you knew all this and you still love me. So how could I say I love you and still be doing all this stuff? Right? Is it love action? Right? I've got it. I've got it taped right here in my Bible, what love is. Love is a, a purposeful commitment to sacrificial action for another. How can I, Lord, be doing these things and say that I love you? That's hypocrisy in the worst form. Right? And so the Lord, I had to just surrender, invite him in, and allow him to do some house cleaning. And he did, and he will. I was messing around, right? We've all got issues. 
And Jesus invites us to bring all of our issues to him, right? He says, cast all your burdens upon me for I care for you. And look at all these burdens we have. Matthew chapter 15, verse 18, it says, but those things which proceed from the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are things that defile a man. We all got a lot of issues. Jesus said, bring me. My yoke's easy. My burden's light. When you do that and you allow him to change your life, then you have this testimony that Abimelech saw in Abraham. God is with you. I can see it. God is with you. Let's pray. Lord, be with us today. Would you draw us close to yourself? Wrap us in your arms of love. You tell us in your word, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. So just as Abraham called on your name, the name of the everlasting God, I just pray for those here today that need to call on your name. Lord, they need to, to know that they can be forgiven. Lord, they need to know that, that you love them. You have a plan and a purpose for their lives. Lord, that you also require a surrender and a turning, a turning from sin and darkness and a turning to, to light and life everlasting that is found only in the person of Jesus. And so as we're just in an attitude of prayer right now, and you need to call on the name of the Lord and just believe and receive and become that child, that son, that daughter of God. If that's you, would you just raise your hand up right now and let me pray for you? You just say, man, I just need this in my life. I see these hands here. God bless you guys. Anyone else? You better see that hand back there. Lord bless you. Thank you, Lord. Way back there. Lord, you're good. See that hand way in the back. Lord, I just pray for these who are lifting their hand, Lord. And in doing so, Lord, it's just this symbolic of them calling on the name of the Lord. Lord, I pray that you'd give them boldness, Lord, to tell somebody, Lord, that they called on your name today, that they believe in the name of Jesus. Lord, that they're gonna turn from their old life and allow you to make a new way for them. For truly you have come to give us that abundant life. Lord, we love you so much and pray that our witness this week would be powerful. Lord, as we're able to uh, make sense of the world confusion and all the things that we see coming at us, Lord, we can, uh, we can proclaim the name of Jesus and the God of heaven, the God of the Jews, uh, and, and the God who loves and sacrificed himself for every Gentile in this world, Lord. And so we love you so much, and we thank you for this opportunity, Lord. May we find ourselves walking in the love of God. Lord, would you search our hearts and know us, as the psalmist wrote, Lord, uh, seek, in, seek our, our um, hearts, and Lord, if there be any wicked way in us, Lord, would you reveal it and uh, lead us in the way everlasting? And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand and worship the Lord.